Well, today is Reformation Sunday, so we can celebrate the birth of Protestantism. Maybe that's a name. Maybe that's a word. I don't know. But anyway, um, we're going to sing, Of Course a Mighty Fortress is Our God. But then we're going to sing songs dealing with grace. Because as I understand it, and I'm no Martin Luther authority, but as I understand it, Martin Luther studied the Bible and decided that we don't get to heaven on our good works. We don't get to heaven by going to church every Sunday or putting money in the offering or doing good deeds. We go to heaven by grace alone. And in Ephesians 2.8, it says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So our theme today is going to be grace. I think you better stand up when we sing this song. <laughs> comes from Psalm 46, 1 and 2 and 10. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. Thank 
for leading us in praise and music. I think you can sit down, can't they? I think you're done for the day. Welcome. Welcome to Harbor of Joy. Some of you are heading to warmer weather. This might be your last Sunday here. But um, we wish you well, and we look forward to... Well, we can't see you on Zoom, but maybe you can Zoom. But uh, we look forward to seeing you along the way and hoping you come back as well in the spring. <clears throat> the spring. Seems like a long ways away right now, doesn't it? Today is Reformation Sunday, and I thought Karen Dawkins did a great job of just reminding us of that. Where are you, Karen? Oh, there you are. Okay. I thought you should be sitting over here. Okay, I'm sorry there, Karen. But a uh, little quiz here. What happened on October 31st, 1517? Remember, 1517. None of, a, none, of a, none of us were born. I was there. Were you there? Did he? <laughs> and and what was the name of the the church that he the door? Where was what town was that in? <laughs> it's in Wittenberg, Wittenberg country of Germany. That's when it all happened, and. Uh, Things were nailed on the church door as a way of telling people what's happening, what's going on in their community, in their town. So it was normal to have go up to the church door and read what was going on. <clears throat> but on that particular day, he uh, nailed his 95 theses. That was where he just said that the Catholic Church was not following what was in the scriptures. And, and so that's when it all began. <clears throat> the Protestant Reformation is what it's called. Notice it said that those who protested against what was taking place, that's how we got the name Protestant. There's protest in Protestant. And so all those that followed Martin Luther were known as Protestants, protesters. And, uh, and uh, he never ever wanted to have a church de denomination named after him. Uh, he was always against that, but that's kind of what the people said. We're, we're, we're Lutherans now. <laughs> That's where Lutheran comes from, is from the people at that time. So I uh, just want you to know that today is kind of the, called Reformation Sunday because it doesn't really happen until Thursday of this coming week. And that's also known probably more so and better in the lives of many people as Halloween. So I just don't know why there's competition always. There's something good to remember about something that happens within the church and spiritually there's always a competition there. There's a, it's like there's always a, something that masquerades, something that's really good that comes from God's word. So uh, with that said, I just want you to know that there's a lot in the bulletin today. Please read it. You don't have to remember it, but just read it. And uh, just wanted to remind you that there is a business meeting. We have two a year. This Sunday is the second one. And uh, it'll be a little bit a break in between. Uh, but uh, be mindful that what's going to happen next week? The wonderful time change. We fall back an hour. <clears throat> so Saturday night of next week, remind yourself, you'll probably hear a lot more about it, but uh, set your clocks back an hour. If you come to church and you did not set your clocks back an hour, <clears throat> you'll be here too early. <clears throat> and if you do set it back and have forgotten about it, um, you might come late, I don't know. Or if you follow what it is, who knows. Just remember to set your clocks back this coming Saturday and you'll be just fine. But that's kind of the change. I don't mind that change as much as the one in the spring. At any rate, so there's other things in the, in the bulletin. Please read them because they're, if I do it, it's going to be a long time. But our our business meeting is going to be a short one, and how do I know this? Is because our president has got pneumonia. He's home. Our vice president had ankle surgery, and he can't make it. His foot is up. 
uh, on, uh, at his house and he can't get around. And then just found out that uh, the one who really helps us with the pro uh, parliamentary procedure and works with finances here at the church, she has COVID. She will not be here. So thankfully, Denny Strzok said that he would do it because he has done it before. And uh, <clears throat> so he'll going to lead it. And so I'll just say it's going to be a really short meeting, hopefully, but we never know. But that's the plan for, for today. Thank you, Denny, for being willing to, to lead it because I sure did not want to. So thanks for coming back as well. So, which reminds me that you know, Dina's mom had passed away, and then so did Dan Winkowicz's brother. And the funeral was this past week. And just, uh, you know, hearts go out to you guys. And, you know, those are strange times when it's like it can be something that is expected, but at the same time, you never know when it happens that it's so final and you deal with it in different ways. And we all deal with grief in a different way, too. But our hearts go out to you and just accept our condolences to you during this time as well. I do want to remind you, even though that Ron Knudsen is not here. Are you, Ron? Men's breakfast this coming Saturday at 7.30 here in Milford. <clears throat> so I just want to make sure you know that we have that. Your guys, you're invited to come to be a part of that on Saturday morning at 7.30. There's been some talk about changing the time because it seems to be quite early on Saturday, but nothing has been decided on that. And as I look at Doran, we're going to start Lunch with the Bunch on Thursday in, I think, the 7th of November. For those of you that have been a part of Lunch with the Bunch, it's open to anybody and everyone. It's from noon to 1, and we're going to study the book of Jude, in case you know that. And uh, it's just, the Jude doesn't even have one chapter, it's just Jude. It's kind of like Obadiah. There's no, there is no chapters, it's just, there it is. That's there. So Jude is what we're going to take a look at. You can read that. It's just, uh, I don't know how many verses that it is, but we'll take it kind of slow. And uh, we will uh, do our best in learning about the book of Jude. It's right before Revelation. So it's the second book at the end of the Bible as you look for it. I do want to remind you that uh, I do see Operation Christmas Child Boxes coming into the church. Thank you for those of you that have done that, have taken a box. You can, if you haven't already, go fill it yourself, bring it back. We'll make sure that they get to where they need to be. And thank you for Kathy Anderson and Carol Banta for kind of being in charge of that. If you've got questions, you can talk to them. And uh, know that uh, in the first, is it the first? Wednesday, I think the first Wednesday in November, we have Carrie Jack that's going to be here in the fellowship room. If you have any questions about dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, she's going to be here to help with those questions and talk about um, people that are going through memory loss. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, we all have people in our families that that happens to. We are, we are, it's just difficult times when that takes place. And so this is for sometimes, sometimes you don't know what to do or what to say or how to handle that. But we have someone coming here, uh, Carrie Jack, she will help us with that and with the questions that you might have that she can answer because she deals with this every day because she works with hospice, St. Croix Hospice in uh, Spencer, I believe. So uh, Alan Holman has been moved to Akira in Spirit Lake, rehab for his broken leg. And um, what else we got in here? Oh yeah, Dylan Burns is going to have some tests done in December on his seizures that he is having. And uh, keep, keep him in your prayers as well. I really, really uh, appreciate what Lynn Ann has said about Dylan that, you know, it's a hard, it's just very hard for a mom to see what her son goes through and what happens to him, and it seems to be like no hope, but at the same time, prayer. She just says, we're, we're just going to pray for God to do what he can uh, for Dylan. One other thing, uh, well, a couple other things in there. There's a LCMC district meeting that's going to take place at Faith Lutheran in Spencer. 
That is coming up. That's in your bulletin. We hope that uh, many of you can be a part of that and go to that. It's $20 per person. Registration begins at 8.30 on a Saturday morning uh, down there in Spencer. And then also uh, a Bible study, reading through the Bible in a year with the Bible recap. You can see Angela Berg or Patty Griffiths and talk to them about that if you've got questions with that. But here's one thing that we do have our eyes set on is to try to have a Sunday school. There are some kids that have been coming here. We're going to start out by having, when the message begins, I'll be able to say, okay, kids, you can go and get together. At, and, but there has to be two people that sign up. And the sign up is on the secretary's office. There has to be two adults. And if, if you don't have two adults signed up, then we just don't, we're not able to do that. So we just need your help in doing that. Right now, there's one person signed up starting on November 10th. And what we need two to be on there as well as the following Sundays as well. It has to be, um, somebody has to be in charge of that with those kids and uh, give them something that they can learn as well when they get together during that time. And then the adults will let them out at like 10.30 to come back to be, with, to be with their parents type of a thing. So we just uh, want to let you know that that's what we want to do. But in order for us to do that, we have to have people volunteer. And, you know, to volunteer means you'll be there on that Sunday to do and take care of these kids. doesn't mean you have to do it every Sunday, but you're, you sign up for it. So that is something that we want to start to do, and hopefully in time we can have a Sunday school in place. But that's where we're going to start. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Let us pray as we uh, move on with our worship service today. But just good to see you. Good to see you guys in the front row here. Well, not the front row, but you're the most front. Even you too, Curtis. You sit right up there. So it's just good to see you close. Anybody else want to come up to the front pew? Guess not. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to be still and to hear your voice to come and to speak to our hearts. And there's a lot of things happening, Lord, that um, we just know that we need you because a lot of these things, they take strength, they take energy, they, they um, are opportunities. And may we never ever have to say, like, I'm too old, I can't do that. That's one thing that I don't really hear in this church, anyone saying I'm too old. But we do have a more mature group of people here than probably most churches. But I'm so thankful for the way that people pitch in and how they help in the ways that they do. We are mindful, Lord, of those that are dealing with the loss of, of family members. Lord, grief is one of those things that it can come at a very unexpected time and an unexpected moment. It can even, something can be said even here in church that makes them say like, you know, I just, I just got to leave. I just can't stand Stand, can't stand this or can't handle this right now. But you understand those things. And if that happens, may they feel free to just uh, have that time to be alone or get away from whatever is on their minds that they need to just deal with. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here today and for those that are in nursing homes that are dealing with different kinds of issues that they would uh, look to you for their strength. And, and Lord, it, it may be a place where uh, some people go and they say, like, I can't believe uh, I haven't been here before. Or I should have came a lot sooner than what I did. And yet there's others that don't like it at all. And so uh, may they know that they're not forgotten. If it's just people calling, if it's cards, if it's, if it's just people stopping in to see them and visit with them, if it's praying with them, however it is, Lord, we, we know that we need you, and our lives are short. We do not know the day nor the hour, but help us to always be ready whenever you call us, and our time here on earth is over. May we know that we are ready and it will be with you. And so we uh, lift up to you all these things that we find in the bulletin that have been shared or not shared, 
They're there for everyone to read and to take part in as they want to. And so we uh, thank you for this time that you've given to us to focus on you and the wonderful words that really spoke to Martin Luther's heart way over 500 years ago that uh, were saved by faith alone. And uh, faith comes to us as we hear your word, as we sing songs where we can understand the words as they minister to us. So be with our time here this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Responsive reading this morning comes from a portion. it's, It's scripture is really what it is, but it's called Unity of Spirit. It's all scripture that we have before us here today. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all in all. If any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, Thank you. Our special number today are the dueling pianos. It's because they can't play banjos <laughs> that they've got pianos. You might recognize what they're going to play, too. Take it away, girls. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sharon.
Good job. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Sharon. I want to just share with you uh, a verse that really impacted Martin Luther 500 years ago. He was a Catholic priest, always was a Catholic priest, even though he was basically looked upon by the Catholic Church as a heretic, but he remained a Catholic priest his whole life. But these were the words in the scriptures that just grabbed his heart and set him free. And because it's Reformation Sunday, I share it with you. It comes from Romans. The first chapter in Romans, I'll read it to you because this is what really gave him freedom and knew that he was following what God had impressed upon his heart. It's chapter 1 of Romans, and it's verse 17. It says this, For in the gospel, and the gospel is what God has done for us, sent us his Son, his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. He took our place and rose again on the third day to tell us that he has won victory over death and over sin and over Satan. And so it is here where he he reads, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, in righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written. And this is Habakkuk. This is a prophet, a minor prophet in the Old Testament who writes this, and this is what we read, The righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. In other words, anybody can have the salvation that God gives by faith, by believing, by trusting what Jesus has done for you. And that's really what set Martin Luther free over 500 years ago, and it has continued to set a lot of people free even throughout the centuries. I invite you to stand as we look at our, our text here this morning. It comes to us from the Gospel of John. Stand if you can. If you can't stand, that's fine too. But we're looking at John chapter 8, verses 31 through 41a. And it's, a good, it's a good text for Reformation Sunday as well. So listen to this. To the Jews who had believed him, important to Catch that word, had. Had is past tense. To the Jews who had believed him. And him is talking about Jesus. Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you that I have seen in the Father's presence and you do what you have heard from your father, small f. And they said, Abraham is our father, small f for father. They answered Jesus, and Jesus replies back, If you were Abraham's children, then you would do the same things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. Period. We'll just stop there. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words that you have given to us to hear today and bring us into the um, place and the situation that we find here in Scripture with Jesus talking to these Jews and what will truly set them free. It's not what they think, but he gives them the truth. So be with us. Help me to preach your word in its clarity and in a way that uh, we can understand it this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We live in a culture today that is obsessed about the word free. As we find in our scripture today, you know, there's there's truth and there's free, freedom. And I want us just to think a little bit about what we find in our culture that is obsessed with the word free. Schools like to say that they are drug-free, alcohol-free, and gun-free and bully-free. <laughs> but they like using the word free. If we look at buildings, different kinds of buildings, remember the day when you could, you could find that no matter which building you went into, there were people smoking. Now these buildings are all smoke-free. Hotels, smoke-free. Well, if you do, there's a different floor that you go on, I guess. There are um, ice cream, well, we'll get that's later on. Uh, Motels, malls, restaurants, and bars are all smoke-free today. Never used to be that way. But everything is given that title. We are a smoke-free establishment. You go on to food. Sugar-free gum. yoo <laughs> You don't want the other stuff. And those things that are sugar-free, do they taste good? I don't think so. But that's the big promotion. Sugar-free gum. You got sugar-free ice cream. Sugar-free cereal. Sugar-free or caffeine-free coffee and pop. Um, Cholesterol-free meals. <laughs> See the word free, how it's always used in our culture today? Never used to be. And we move on, we find, uh, how about banks and clothes? Free checking. <laughs> free interest loans, or interest-free loans, however you want to put that. Um, there's even wrinkle-free clothing. It's there. And then we think of uh, Jimmy John's. What do they have on their window? <laughs> free smells. <laughs> you know, free is, we see it all over the place. And then there is uh, books and seminars that you can either buy or go to. Of course, you have to pay to go to seminars too, but how about having a stress-free marriage? Come to this seminar. Have a stress-free marriage. I go like, get out of here. How about stress-free parenting? Come and learn how to, have a, how to be a parent that is stress-free, being a parent. How about uh, even maybe sometimes when it comes to medical areas, pain-free. <laughs> we do things here pain-free. It, it will not hurt you. The word free is used very, very often in our culture. We find in Scripture today that it is Jesus talking with, with these Jews about wanting to be free. And Jesus is coming from the standpoint of there's a spiritual freedom that people need to know about and need to experience and need to have in their own lives. Where the Jews were talking about more of a political kind of freedom, because they were under Roman domination. 
We'll get into that a little bit more as we go on here. But I want you to look at who is, who is doing the speaking here in our text. Let's look at, the, at the, the truth of the person who makes this statement. The one who says the truth will set you free. Who says that? We find it's Jesus Christ who says that. Did Jesus ever lie? He always told the truth. He always came across in a way that, out of a loving heart, that he was telling them things that they didn't understand. And, and for some, you know, you've heard, you've heard the, the saying, truth hurts, which we know it does. But sometimes we need to hear the truth, even when it hurts. Jesus is talking about the truth of being free spiritually in your lives. That shows in your lives if you are or if you aren't. If you're not free, then you are in bondage. You are a slave. And Jesus says that's not what he desires. He wants us to all be free and to be sons in in the family of God. We live in a world that doesn't believe in truth anymore. It's called relativism. Relativism is what is true for you. Now, it's not true for me. That's how people respond to each other. Well, it might be true for you, but it's not true for me. That's relativism. That has been going on for decades. There is no absolute truths in our culture today. In other words, there is no black and white like there once was. The gray area used to be pretty small. Now the gray area has gone, ooh, it just kind of keeps getting bigger and bigger. Jesus is very, very pointed and what he's saying to the Jews here. And that's why I had you notice that it says that these Jews had, and that's past tense. They had followed him, they had believed in him, but now they've changed their mind somewhere along the way. I don't know what, what that was. Maybe they thought that he, was, he came to set them free from Rome, and they realized he wasn't going to do that. He's not gonna be a, he doesn't want to be a king, even though he is a king of kings and a lord of lords. But these Jews did want to kill him. So I don't know if they're part of the Pharisees or part of the Sadducees, if they're religious Jews here. I have no idea. It doesn't say. But Jesus knows that these Jews want to kill him. The saddest part when we think about being relativism today, there is no truth. It means then that there's a lot of people today who do not believe that this this book, the Bible, is not true anymore. They'll say this is not God's word anymore. I say it is. And I say that this is all true, what we find in here. And I know I'm a real minority person (laughs) when I say that. And Jesus would back me up on that. But we have some preachers and some pastors and even some priests today who are in pulpits, even speaking today, who do not believe that this is truth. It's just more literature. It's just good teaching. It's good for people to hear. But it's not God's truth. The saddest part is is that the people who hear things that are spoken that this is not God's truth, they still will come and sit in the pew and listen to what is preached to them. It's very simple, my friends. All you have to do is ask the pastor of the church or whoever is leading the church that you attend, just ask the pastor, do you believe that the Bible is true? 
is it really God's word? And if he cannot or if she cannot answer in the affirmative, <laughs> it's time to leave. Or it's time to explain to them why they are not teaching the truth, what they need to show you in the Bible, what they're saying. Is it all from what the Bible says or is it your own opinions? I read a, a good letter, just a kind of a question-answer thing from Hope Lutheran in Des Moines, who has left the ELCA and joined the LCMC. And it, gives a, it just gives a good a question-answer type of a thing, back and forth, where the pastor down there had just said, you know, they've tried everything they could to try to change it within the big denomination and it was going nowhere. And some of their own pastors have gone through the seminary, that ELCA seminary, but they were targeted as like, you know, you're not, you're, we just don't like you. <laughs> we don't like your preaching. We don't like where you're coming from and what you're saying because it doesn't go along with what we think you should be saying. And so the, the long story short, the leadership and the pastor down in Hope, Des Moines, Iowa, just said, it's time, it's not that we have left the ELCA, it's that the ELCA has left them. And they just need to go on with what they're doing. And they have pastors that are all in harmony with what they're doing there, and they just said they're, they're going to affiliate with the the LCMC because they're the closest to where they are in what they're doing down there. And that's a huge, huge, let me even know the church. I've never been there. I don't know anything really about the church other than it's huge. So um, stay tuned. See how things go with uh, the church there. Pray for them. Come across your mind as well. Jesus is saying that truth sets people free. And that's really what I want to convey to you today as well. The truth sets you free. It may be difficult at times. It may be hard. You may not want to admit it. But there was a day I needed to hear the truth. And I didn't like what I heard. <laughs> but you know, if I didn't listen to the truth, I'd be going to hell. Jesus makes that big of a difference. I may not like to hear what I was hearing, but I knew it was true. And that's what I wanted, was the truth. Some evangelist or pastor many, many years ago said, you know, the first thing that happens to a person who, who hears the gospel is they get mad. And then they think about it more, and then they get sad before they can get glad when they understand what God has done for them. I go, that's good. It all rhymes. Mad, sad, but ultimately you become glad when you hear the gospel. You hear salvation, how it's free to all who will come and receive it and to believe in it. So who is Jesus speaking to here? I've said it before, he's believing the Jews, the believing Jews who once believed in him, but they're still around him. And uh, Jesus gives this response to them. You find it right there in the scriptures, right here in John chapter 8. He says, if you hold to my teaching, in other words, if you really believe, then you would want to follow what I'm going to say here to you. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So if you don't hold on to his teachings, then how can you call yourself a disciple? Faith is like a glove. The two go together. Glove in the hand. The hand goes into the glove. He says then, if you follow his teaching, you'll be his disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
It's pretty simple, isn't it? The truth will set you free. We talked about the word free. I want us to focus on the word truth. They responded, the Jews responded back to Jesus in an interesting way. Kind of defensive. But they said, we are Abraham's descendants. Now you go way back to Abraham. Thousands of years ago, back to Abraham. We are his descendants. And we have never been slaves of anyone. Catch that? We have never been slaves to anyone. Liars, liars, pants on fire. Did they forget about Moses in Egypt? They were slaves of the Egyptians. Moses came to rescue them, to get out of Egypt. Do they remember what happened in 586 B.C.? When King Nebuchadnezzar, who was a Babylonian, came and destroyed Jerusalem and took captives from the southern kingdom and took them to what is modern-day Iraq or Iran. They were slaves back in Babylon. Many years later, they were allowed to go back and rebuild the walls to Jerusalem under King Cyrus. So how can they say they've never been slaves to anyone? In the day in which they live here, they're under Roman rule. In a lot of ways, they are slaves to Rome and are to listen to what the Caesar, who is known as the God of Rome, what he said went. But they go back, oh, we're descendants of Abraham. <laughs> you go, that's enough to make you want to just laugh. But that's what they're holding on to. And Jesus is talking about spiritually those who sin, and that's all of us, are slaves to sin. Don't want to admit that, do you? But it's the truth. If we sin, then we're slaves to sin. I want to read to you in Romans. I've shared this with a number of people over the years who have come with issues in their lives. And maybe you will identify with what it says here in Romans chapter 7 because I'll, I'll just ask for a show of hands if you can identify with this. Romans chapter 7, with starting with verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. The law is, remember, it's, the law is always pointing its finger at you. Do this or else. <laughs> or if it's a cop that pulls you over and he points his finger at you, guess what? You're guilty of something. You've done something wrong. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. And this is Paul who's writing this, and he's saying that he is unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. Now, how can somebody like Paul admit to that? That he's doing here. He's a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Follow me so far? Sound like you? <laughs> we can all agree to that. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, 
this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Does this sound like you? Raise your hand if it does. Yeah, some of you didn't go up too high. You just kind of went, oh. no. So he goes on and he says this. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. And his conclusion is this. What a terrible person I am. I'm a rotten, no good bum. Well, he doesn't say that there. He just says, what a wretch. <laughs> no one likes to call himself a wretch. I think uh, amazing grace. I think the word wretch was originally put in there and some have taken the word wretch out to soften it to something else today. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And his answer is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the one who will rescue us from sin. There is no other place to go to. There's no other person to go to that can help you. It's only Jesus Christ. Hmm. If you go back one chapter in chapter 6, verse 20 to 22, being it short, I'll just read it to you, that says this. Also, Paul is writing. And he says, uh, let me find it here, 20. When you were slaves to sin, now, good thing it says were. Were is past tense. You once were, you're not anymore. This is the way you were before. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Talking about, hey, this is how you used to live. This is what you love to do with sinful because you did not know anything about the gospel. You did not know anything about righteousness or being righteous before God. And now when you think of that, you're ashamed. You feel bad. You're guilty. But Jesus changes that. It says those things that you used to do, the result is death. We're talking about spiritual death. You don't go to heaven if you're involved in those kinds of things. And there can be many, many of them. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to who? To God. And some don't like the word slave. Well, then put servant. <laughs> you become a servant of God. God has changed you from a slave to be one of his servants because you now love God and you want to follow him. You come into his family. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Not death. The result is now eternal life. Oh man, we're at 1030 already. <laughs> Okay, well, here's, I got to get, I'll narrow it all down to here. Uh, you can be a slave of sin or a slave to sin and not know it. You can be a religious person and still not know Jesus Christ. You do all the right things that are acceptable and people enjoy, but personally to you, you can go through all the motions and still not know Jesus. 
You can hold on to your church's teaching and beliefs and forget what the Bible says. Is what is taught here. And, you know, this is a real broad stroke here of, of people who would just go to churches. Is what is being taught and promoted, is it what the Bible preaches and teaches? That's what's really important. That's what Martin Luther said, you know. We're not hearing the truth. And he went to Rome to see the Pope because the Pope had called him, I want to see you. And he's being called to the office. You're in trouble. (laughs) And so Martin Luther went down there knowing that This isn't going to be good. He took with him his 95 theses, and he took his books and and the Bible with him, and he found out that the council that he went before did not want to even go there with him. They just said, recant of everything you have said, or else you're going to be burned at the stake or hung till you're dead. And Martin Luther said those famous words that still ring true today. He said, here I stand. You show me where I'm wrong, and I will recant. But if you can't show me in the Bible where I'm wrong, then here I stand. Even if it meant dying for what he believed. Because he's standing on God's word. No wonder he wrote that hymn we heard twice today. A mighty fortress is our God. Today the Bible has lost its authority for faith and life. People say, oh, you don't have to read that anymore. You don't have to go by what the Bible says anymore. We kind of have evolved and we're much better now today than where we were at. But no, we don't pay much attention to the Bible. I've even heard of someone taking the Bible and dropping it into a trash can. I go like, good grief. Does that person really know what they just have done? Is God's word true or not? Do you know what is right and wrong? How does what you believe match what God's word says? Not in a condemning and judgmental way, but in a loving way. A lot of us in the church get accused of being condemners and standing for wrong things or or against things. Always the negative. And I'm going like, well, that's not always true. We just stand on what the word says. The word speaks for itself. If you want to shoot me for that, so be it. There are some things we don't understand. I admit, yeah, don't understand everything. But what is important is easily understood. So when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. I'll end with this. There's only one way that you can be set free, and the truth is learning how to forgive others. Forgiveness will set you free. We say it every time we say the Lord's Prayer. The fifth petition. It says, forgive us our trespasses. We're admitting we're a sinner. But then it goes on and it says, as we forgive those who trespass against us. How many times have you said this prayer and in your own life you don't follow it?
I'm guilty. But that's what Jesus says. Learn how to forgive and to love. Not everyone is going to like you. Not everyone is going to want to follow you. All you can say is, that's what I see what the Bible says. Are you free today? If you're not, come to Jesus and follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts here today. May you use what has been received today. Even if it's a seed, may it fall on good ground and sprout and grow and mature. But at least it's got a starting place to do something and to bring about results that will change us from the inside out. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was able to say this to those around him. And I tell you the truth. The truth will set you free. And that's what everyone needs. Like it or not. To know the truth and to be set free spiritually. In your name we pray. Amen. Because I rambled on, let's just close with the Lord's Prayer. And then we'll just, what comes after that? The song. Well, we're not going to do that today. Just way too much. we got a meeting as well. I'm just going to say, forgive me for that. We're just going to do things short, shorter. So, If you want to say the Apostles' Creed, you can say it, out, you can say it on your way home <laughs> or on the way out the door, and the Lord will hear you. The main thing is you do it for him, not that we just do it to do it. Okay? So let's uh, say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us in temptation. But deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, may you be with these friends that are here today. May they stand for you. May they love you, and may they show it through their lives each and every day. We pray this, Lord, as you help us to do this. In your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead. Oh, you don't want to play? Do what you want to do, Karen, because I'm out of here.